Hey, good evening, everybody. Welcome to the virtual night sky, our version for, uh, let's see, what is it, June 29th, um, where it feels like summer. It feels like uh, we're in the middle of summer, and uh, and we've got a really, really exciting program for you. We're going to keep this going every other week and, uh, and into the fall and year round if we can. So I appreciate everybody joining us. My name is Rick Allen, and I am a manager of community outreach for the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. We're doing things a little bit different differently tonight. So if you're new to the program, right, we're sort of like, you will uh, you're gonna, you're gonna like this format. Uh, if you've been watching us for a long time, you know, I'm normally sitting at my station at home, and we're broadcasting from there. But no, tonight, I'm actually in the building, uh, the headquarters of the School of Earth and Space Exploration. The building has a strange name, we call it ISTV4. It's on the main ASU campus, the one in Tempe. And in this particular building, it's seven stories, but the first two floors are actually public access. Uh, it's a place where you can come visit. And even in the summertime, right, we're open here, generally here between 9.30 and about 3.30 or 4 in the afternoon. If you want to just drop by, see what we're doing and take a look at the building, you certainly can do that. The first floor has some devices and some things. I'm going to show you one of those a little in a little bit. Uh, but on the second floor, there's a really special place. It's called the Busick Center for Meteorite Studies. And it is a meteorite center that you can come visit. That's going to be the main part of our show tonight. I'm going to introduce in a little bit our guest, and he's going to walk us through not only the public parts of the meteorite center, but we're going to give you a really special treat. We're going to get you into uh, the place where they keep the stuff, the place where they do the research on the meteorites themselves. And so, so that's really coming up. Uh, let me introduce who's here tonight. Uh, as you probably know, many of the characters are already here. Uh, Meg Hufford is off. She's on vacation, a much needed vacation. She's back in the Midwest place and so she's not going to be joining us um, but Kim Batista is here you know her as our webmaster and she is the one uh, kind of that does the communications and gets you going and and uh, make sure everybody has the right uh, uh, right logins and everything so Kim thank you very much for all your all the work you do Alicia Hyatt is here. She's a, a staff member. She's an education specialist for us, and she'll be helping with questions and sort of uh, some of the background stuff that's going on behind the scenes here. Alex Blanche is also our camera operator. We don't usually do this, but we actually have a roving camera, and so we'll be moving around the center here a little bit, sort of showing you some of the things that are going on in the, in the building. So that'll be really super cool. And Armand, uh, one of our newest students, is in the background. Uh, I just want to talk to you about question and answer tonight, especially tonight of all nights. We always say, please, please, please kind of just, just ask the questions as you go along. We want this to be a dialogue. We want this to be sort of talking, asking questions from you and listening to Lawrence kind of show us around um, the Meteorite Center here. Uh, but this is going to flow because you're asking questions. So I'm going to ask you to use the Q&A button, uh, not the chat button, but the Q&A button. I'm going to ask you to sort of just open that up, uh, write your question in there as we go along, and uh, you're going to learn an awful lot about meteorites and the research that meteorites happen tonight and, and all of that. At the end, before we sort of close tonight, I'm going to give you a couple of announcements. There's some things coming up. We're going to give you a little preview of some of the sort of at least of some things to look forward to as we move into July and uh, and some things to look at in the night sky. So first and foremost, um, we're just going to get right on with the Meteorite Center. So it's really my pleasure to uh, to introduce uh, the curator of the Music uh, Center for Meteorite Studies right here on the ASU campus. And uh, there we go. We've got a little view of the Meteorite Center. We've got a view of Lawrence Garvey. And I'm just going to turn it over to him. Let him take it from here. Thank you, Lawrence. Okay, thanks, Rick. And welcome, everyone night scout presentation here and here look here here we have the Buzek center for meteorite studies public gallery what we're going to really do over the next hour or so is just sort of look at what we have what's so special about the collection that we have and we're going to start off here out in the gallery for the next sort of 10 minutes or so look at a few things but really this gallery is open to you guys to come and have a look at during the week and i have a, i'd say i'll probably on the order of 100 distinct different types of meteorites out here for you to look at. And what we're gonna do is look at a few of the meteorites, but before we do that, let's just start with some definitions, okay? Meteor versus meteorite. A meteor is a shooting star. It's something you see up in the sky, usually just a very brief flash in the sky. That's typically a small piece of, I don't know, a sand-sized piece of dust. And if it was a bright meteor, maybe something about the size of a small grape or something like that, burning up in the upper atmosphere. But if they're larger, let's say, I'm just gonna guess here, something, let's say something about this size, right? It comes into the atmosphere. Now it's gonna make a really bright 
meteor trail. And if it's large enough and survives that fiery entry into the upper atmosphere, it can actually break up in the lower atmosphere and then drop stones onto the ground. Those stones are meteorites. That's what we pick up, that's what we study, and that's what we have here. And two other words that I'd actually like to define, and I'll just use as we're going along, is fall versus find. Let's say you're lucky enough to be outside, there's a big meteor event, it drops some stones, some meteorites on the ground, you pick them up, that's a fall. They're really fresh. Those are, the, those are the ones we really want to study. They've been on the earth the least amount of time, they're the freshest ones, and they hold, they hold the highest scientific value for us. Also wanted to also bring up rarity. And this is something I think people often misunderstand. You know, when you come to a collection, both out here, especially once we go into the meteorite vault itself, you're gonna see lots and lots, lots of meteorites. And people think that meteorites are actually easy to find. And I'd like to just give an example. Okay, so here's some numbers. That, and this is, this is one of my favorite sets of numbers. The fall rate. So how many meteorites fall in a particular region at a particular time. And the sort of the ballpark figure that we use is one fall per square kilometer. That's about a half, just under a half a square mile per 10,000 years. So in other words, there are very few of them fall on any particular piece of ground at any time. So if we, to give an example, if you were to go out into the desert right now, there are meteorites out there and start hunting, and, we, and you know what you were looking for, and really hunting, it would probably take you on the order of a week or two or three to find your first meteorite. They're actually that rare. So that's just something I really wanted to point out. You know, you're very unlikely, I quite often have people say, hey, I went out for a hike this afternoon, and I found half a dozen meteorites out in the desert. That never happens. If you really know what you're looking for, you might find one every few weeks or so if you really know what to look for. And I also, I also thought this was quite fun. So another term that we also use is meteor wrong. Let me just get a meteor wrong. So a, mete a meteor wrong is something that is brought in that people think is a meteorite. The most common meteor wrong that people bring in is this. And it looks odd, okay? I understand why people bring this, bring this in. If you look, you can see it's sort of purplish and shiny and it's quite dense, and it looks actually extraterrestrial, but it isn't. This is actually a piece of industrial slag. This is the most common meteor wrong brought in by, by members of the public. It's used, as you can imagine, this is used as railway ballast, it's used as ballast for roads, it's all over the United States. And so this, look at that, that flow-like texture on there, that purpley structure, this is our most commonly brought in meteor wrong. Actually, this was one that was brought in a few years ago by a mem member of the public. So let's just have a look. Now, as I said, this, this public gallery is open during the week. So I'm not going to say, I don't want to spend too long out here, but let's look at a few things. Let's look at three things. So let's have a look over here. This is a case that I put together a few years ago, really to indicate what meteorites look like on the ground. Basically, they're rocks. So if you imagine these are rocks, once they sit on the ground for a few years, they weather, they look very similar. And if, if, if we look here, right at the center here, I'm pointing right down to this brown rock here. He's just focusing in now. It's the one with the tarantula on it. You can all see that. So I've got the tarantula sitting on an actual meteor. This was one that was found in northwestern Arizona a few years ago. And you can see it's just got that, it's, it's a relatively nondescript brown rock. But this one was found with somebody using a metal detector because it actually has a fair amount of free nickel-rich iron in it. So this is just pure iron in it. And that, and that can be detected by a, by a metal detector. And even more, com even more difficult to recognize, just behind it, I say, there's, there's another one behind it with a green dot on it. That's also a meteorite from the same field. So this is part of the problem of recognizing meteorites, is that when you get out into the field, when you actually go out into the desert, they look like normal rocks because they are rocks. We also, if we have a look at, at some of the other things in the case, let's see if we can, how about the one over here with the, with the roach on it? Can you see that? So this is another meteorite from the desert. This is one from, from Chile. This is one that's been weathering out in, the, out in the desert for a few years. Again, people often say to me, how do you know something is or is not a meteorite? And it's like, I think like any field that, that where one's collecting things and studying things for a while, you begin to recognize what to look for in a meteorite and what to look, and what, so what meteorites contain and what they don't contain. So we look at some of the other rocks in here. Let's see if we can focus down on just any of the large non-meteoritic rocks. 
or just wait for a second while we're moving the camera. So these are some just sort of quartz rich rocks that I picked up from the desert. They're coarsely crystalline. They've got large lumps of quartz in it. Some of them have large lumps of felspar in them. They have basically they have minerals and textures that we just do not see in meteorites. So that's one of the things you really have to see a lot of meteorites, actually hold a lot of meteorites to say, to really have a good idea of what is possibly a meteorite and what is not a meteorite. But most terrestrial rocks, if you, go, if you just go outside, for instance, and have a look, most terrestrial rocks contain structures, minerals, and features that we do not find, typically find in meteorites. Let's have a look at another thing. So I was said I would just want to show two or three things here in the public gallery before we go into the meteorite vault itself. Let's have a look over here. We also have a central case that I try to change out every once in a while. Something new, something, uh, something unusual. In this case, this was a, a meteorite that fell. A very interesting, a very important meteorite that fell in Costa Rica a few years ago. I won't say much about it here. We'll talk more about it when we get into the vault. But suffice to say, we called it an extraterrestrial mud ball. And have a look, it's a, they're just black stones. These ones, these ones were actually picked up uh, within hours of actually falling out in the, out in the jungles. And fortunately, the time, uh, uh, Costa Rica is a place where that gets a lot of rain. Fortunately, these meteorites actually fell just in a short dry period of time in, in Costa Rica. So this is an amazing thing. We had a beautiful story that came out on this. We've done some amazing research on this new meteorite so far, and research is continuing. We'll talk more about this meteorite when we go into the meteorite vault itself as well. One more thing I'd like to show. Again, there's many, many different things for you to come and see in the, in the collection here. As I said, we try not to make it a static collection, but we try to change things out. We try to change some of the other displays every once in a while as well. And for instance, this was a display I put together after the amazing event in 2013 over southern Russia. This was a, this is called, I'm sure many of you have heard of it, it's called Chelyabinsk. I mean, if, just go to YouTube, for instance, and, and type in Chelyabinsk meteor event. It was one of the most recorded meteor events ever. This was a bus size, the size of a bus, a bus sized object that came into the atmosphere, came in about 41,000 miles per hour. It produced the most amazing trail in the atmosphere broke up into millions and millions of pieces. And in fact, in this case, our atmosphere did exactly what we wanted it to do. It took this bus sized object and broke it up into these multitude, millions upon millions of little stones that rained down onto the ground. So it was not the meteorite, the meteor and the meteorite itself that caused damage on the ground, but it was the shock wave from the object coming into the atmosphere and breaking up in the atmosphere that caused uh, damage to the ground. So basically, this is this just a, a little. It's just a little teaser of what we have in the in the in this public display. Come and have a look. We've got um, things in several different types of things in cases. We've got some explanations. I have over there an explanation of Moon and Mars meteorites. How do we know they come from the Moon? How do we know they come from Mars? So it's a great place to come and have a look at some of the materials here. But this is open during the week as well. What I'd like to do is hand over to Rick now, because what we're going to do, we're going to have to move the camera now to the meteorite vault. So we're going to go, we're going to go sign it for about a minute. So don't go away. Excellent. Hey, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, you guys, uh, I, I, I always just, I could just listen to Lawrence for hours. He's encyclopedic in what he knows about meteorites and especially uh, our particular collection. So, so indeed, this is what we're doing. So that's the public area, but in a slightly different part of the building uh, is what we call the meteorite vault. That's the place where the, the, the specimens are stored. That's where the curation happens, the classification happens, and they're going to get themselves set up in there and you're going to get invited right into the vault and we'll just be kind of back with that in a minute. I wanted to show you something else. I'm downstairs now and one of the main features in our little thing here, you can see this big huge spherical ball behind me. Uh, that's actually the earth on the ball. I can kind of play with it and move it around all this stuff and you can do this, right? Uh, the kids love this thing if you want to kind of bring them down to see what the thing looks like. But I wanted to tell you just a little bit about, about asteroid research for a moment. I'm going to turn the ball into something. It just looks like a little, it looked like a gravel ball. 
This is actually a map of an asteroid called Bennu. And the reason I'm introducing it now is because I just want people, we always love to have people think that asteroid research is really big right now. There's all kinds of missions that are headed for asteroids. And, and why, right? Asteroids hold some of the secrets of the very, very beginning of our solar system. Everything on the earth has been changed, has been altered. All of our rocks have been melted or tossed or turned and reconstituted in various ways. But if we can actually get stuff from space, like meteorites that fall from space and come into the into the into the the uh, onto the Earth, and we can research them. But there's also you've been hearing a little bit about some snatch and grab missions. So there was a mission to Bennu, the rock pile behind me. This particular asteroid is only about a half a kilometer across, so it's fairly small. It would fit easily onto the ASU campus if we could bring it down here. Uh, but a mission called OSIRIS-REx uh, successfully went in and just grabbed some of that stuff, they call it regolith, off the surface, put it into a little uh, uh, probe, and it's on its way back to the Earth. Sometime next year, I think kind of in the latter half of next year, we're going to get some material from Bennu. And ASU is on the list of researchers that are going to get some the stuff and we're going to help determine what Bennu is all about and what those samples are. And so I want to talk a little bit as we get into the vault and as you get a little bit going, uh, I'm going to ask Lawrence a little later to talk to us a little bit about what's the difference between going to space and getting something or letting it fall through the sky and picking it up here and doing it. So I can see that they're uh, pretty much ready in the vault. And so I'm going to just sort of, if, if Elisa gives me the high sign, oh, she's running away. <laughs> I can, if that's how Sounds like the high sign. So I think they're ready up there. They're in station. And so I'm going to turn it back over to the roving camera team and, uh, and enjoy what you see. Come on. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Now we've had to change the camera. Look where we are. We're in the meteorite vault now. This is where we have thousands and thousands of different types of meteorites. And it's somebody, people often ask me, how many meteorites do you have? It's difficult to say. I mean, 10, 40,000, 50,000. But what we know we have, we have, so I'm at, okay, so let me just step back a little bit. We said we have falls and finds. Each new meteorite that is found is given a name, okay? So if one, let's say one were to fall in Phoenix tomorrow and it would be classified, it would be called Phoenix. And we haven't had one from Phoenix, but we did have one fall in Glendale a few years ago, a single stone and that was called Glendale. So we have over 2,000 distinct falls and finds in this collection here. And what, what, what I want to do here is just, we're just going to pick a few things and talk about them. And as questions come up, it might change the course of the conversation as well. But what I'd like to do is to start with something that's really Arizona. This, this iron meteorite, OK? I think many of you are online right now know what this is. It's quite heavy. This is a big lump of iron. I'll put it here. This is a minuscule piece of the, the asteroid, this case. So an asteroid is a, is, a, is a relatively large object from space that punched a hole through the atmosphere around 50,000 years ago, largely stayed intact, but we'll get to that in a minute, and made this crater here in Arizona, a meteor crater or Barringer crater. In fact, what I love to show, so this is an aerial view of the crater, and what I love to show here for on, in this view, I see I have reflections, one second. Okay, what I'd what I love to show in this view, if we just look at this corner here, there's a little white dot. That's the visitor center, right, which, is, which they built on the edge of the crater. That visitor center is about the size of the object that made the crater. So you have to imagine we have something that's, that's about 100 or so foot in diameter, maybe a bit larger, traveling at several miles, you know, by the time it hit the ground, probably up to about 10 miles per second. That's an enormous amount of energy that has to go somewhere. As that thing hits the ground, all that, sh that shock wave propagates into the ground, excavates the crater. But what also happens is that as it hits the ground, as that large object hits the ground, so much energy is transferred into the object that it essentially vaporizes the vast majority of the impacting asteroid. So the objects like this one, Oh, this is heavy. The objects like this one here, what we believe is that these were pieces that were coming off of it as, it as the main mass was coming in. And that's why we have these meteorites that are being found around the crater. They are pieces that were falling off. So it was not one big impact and the meteorite and the bit, that big object exploded into lots of little pieces. But what did happen as to that main object, so we think that like 99 
ish percent of the main impactor that made the crater actually vaporized, produced vapor, a vapor plume above the crater, which then recondensed around the crater. And I'll show you what it condensed into. You're going to have to follow me over here. Okay, we're just going to follow to another, to another cabinet here. So 99% of the impactor did not survive as individual large lumps of iron, but instead, instead produced impact spheroids. So this is a jar, okay, this is a jar of small metal-rich sulfur-rich spheroids from that, imagine the, the impactor got so hot that it essentially vaporized it, but it recondensed just above the crater and then, and then sort of rained down around the crater. That's what happened to about 99% of the impactor itself. And only a relatively small percentage of, it, of the impactor survived as these beautiful iron meteorites that we, that we collect and that, and that our, it, the crater is so well known for. So this is, this is just a small selection of the impact material. Unfortunately, we're gonna have to move back a bit but what also happened, what's also really exciting, what also happened, some of the meteorites, so imagine when this, when this big impactor came down and made the crater, an enormous shock wave propagated outward from that impact site. Some of the falling irons around it that intersected with that shock wave themselves were shocked. And what that shock did, let's move over here, it took, so here's, so here's, what we're gonna do is we're gonna to try to show, let's see what you can, let's have a look here. Can we see that? Okay, so here we have a slice through a large Canyon Diablo iron. So what we can see in the inside here, this is what, what we can see are these large rounded lumps, in this case of graphite and iron sulfide. Imagine this is basic, this is a basically a big lump of steel that had too much, that had too much, um, uh, had too much carbon in it, had too much sulfur in it, it couldn't dissolve into the steel. So as it was cooling from high temperatures, it aggregated into these rounded lumps of graphite and iron sulfide and a few other minerals as well. But there were some of the meteors as they were coming down that really were close to the impact site. And in this case, the shock wave that propagated through the iron was so intense that it instantaneously, it's actually not instantaneous, it's a, few, it's a few tens of nanoseconds, so billionths of a second, instantaneously converted some of the carbon that's in there, the graphite, into diamonds. And I don't know, how, let's see how easily we can see this. Where that red arrow is, we're just focusing the camera now, where that red arrow, arrow is, that little, that, that is pointing to a large cluster of diamonds in this. There we are, got that beautifully in focus now. So, it, so the shock wave instantly converted, almost instantly converted graphite into diamonds. Now, what's really interesting about the diamonds, we actually, we've been studying the diamonds from Canyon Diablo for several years now. What happened was that they formed so rapidly and then they cooled so rapidly that in some instances, the graphite to diamond transition wasn't, is not completely finished. So we have some intermediate structures. In fact, in fact we are able to, to reveal the, graphite to diamond transition by looking at the types of, uh, by looking at the diamonds that are in this meteorite, something that we haven't been able to do from other samples that made in the lab before. Okay, can they hear that noise? If you, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a hissing noise behind me every once in a while, and I wanted to yeah, get Yeah, we can hear it. You know, one of the things I haven't said yet, this is, so in the, the, the vault is also humidity controlled, because look, we've just looked at a big lump of iron, Okay, we don't, we, we live in a relatively dry environment, but like today, we have monsoons that move through here. And if I were to have this at home, with the slightly high, higher humidity that we have now, rust would start to form on here. So what we're, what, so this room we actually keep under relatively low humidity at all times. So it doesn't matter what's happening outside, we can have monsoons moving through. It doesn't matter what's happening outside. The, all, we don't get any rust forming in here. So it's, one of the, it's called curation. It's keeping the samples safe and it's keeping the samples protected for current and future research. Lawrence, I, I wanted to okay. just uh, stop for a quick okay. question okay. here. And uh, we, uh, I know we've, got, we've been holding some from the audience, so I'm gonna try to get that in vault intro too. But I just have a really silly question for you. 
I always thought that meteorites were so hard that you, you couldn't cut them, or they, I mean, these, their slices are pretty detailed, okay. and so how does that happen? Okay, so it's a specialist job to cut a meteorite like this, oh, yeah. and we don't, and I don't have the, the time, expertise, or patience to cut these, so we have to send them to somebody, and in fact, these were very, very difficult to cut because these had been sh partially shocked. There are diamonds in this, and so each slice, the, the, the expert preparer who did this, as his name is Robert Ward, each slice took 18 hours to cut. And so it's very slow. So the reason we don't go any faster either, also, we don't want to change the structure. If you were to, if you were to take like an angle grinder and try and grind through it and you get sparks flying everywhere, you're heating the sample and you're melting the, the, the thin surface of the sample and you're changing the structure. So it's a very slow, it took about 18 hours per slice and took about another 18 hours to grind it and polish it and etch it. So all, the other thing I also said, I haven't said yet, is that if you look here, can we see up close? Can, we, can they see the structure? What we, some of you may have heard of a Wittmannstatten structure. It is the metallic structure that we see here. Can, we, can they see that or yeah, not? I can see some just little white uh, lines. You can see some lines. Yes. So those lines that you're seeing are actually crystals of iron. Now, in order to form this crystalline structure, you, you require exceedingly slow cooling rates. So, okay, let's just say for a minute, let's say um, when you were born, let's say uh, you, your, your parents took a, a, a jar of nickel-rich iron and melted it to, uh, you know, above the melting point. And then slowly over your lifetime, you cooled it slowly, slowly. So let's say over 100 years, you slowly cooled it down to, let's say, four or 500 degrees C. Would you see this structure? No. This structure actually requires millions of years of slow cooling to form. So when we see this Wittmannstatten structure in nickel-rich iron, we know, A, it's meteoritic, because it took millions of years to form. You can't make this Wittmannstatten structure in nickel-rich iron in the laboratory. It just takes too long. I think we have an audience question for you. Okay. Yeah, uh, I noticed you're wearing gloves now, and Mary mm -hmm. mentioned um, should you wear gloves to prevent contaminating the sample, samples, or um, where should you take the samples once you find them? Okay, the first part, you know, I'm wearing gloves here because no matter how well we clean our hands, we've got oils on our hands, we touch things, and you can see meteorites that have been touched by hand, they get sort of a greasiness to them. But, and so we don't want that greasiness. So, let, so, okay, let's also step back. If you're out meteorite hunting for a, what we call a cold find. You're just out in the desert, you're picking up an old weathered meteorite, you don't need to wear gloves. But let's say there was this really rare meteorite fall around just by your house tonight. Then by all means, don't touch it. You know, get a piece of plastic, pay, carefully pick it up and wrap it up because we want to preserve it. And that's also particularly important for the meteorites that are, that are clay rich and organic rich. And we've been hearing this this sort of hissing sound every once in a while back here. So while this room we have low humidity, you know, a few, a few percent humidity in here, relative humidity, what it, this is a way to keep the meteorites even more pristine, even, even uh, more out of the Earth's atmosphere. So I'm going to open this just for a second. So these are nitrogen cabinets. These, these are cabinets that have basically dry nitrogen. So if I would put my head in there right now and take a deep breath, I would instantly pass out. There's no oxygen in there. There's no water vapor in there at all. So this is a way to keep certain meteorites that are very, very sensitive to the air absolutely pristine and, and, and ready for future study. So here, for instance, notice I'm holding this one really, really carefully. Here is one of the stones that fell in Costa Rica a few years ago called Aguasarcus because it fell in the town of Aguasarcus. It's black on the outside and there's a few chips. It's also black on the inside. This stone is clay rich. In other words, it's clays, it's full of water, extraterrestrial water, but it's also full of organic compounds as well. So organic compounds, you know, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen type compounds that are present in here. So in order, now, if we were just to keep this in the atmosphere here, it's also highly porous. So this, again, you can hear the, you can hear the nitrogen going into the cabinets. These are also highly porous. So you have to imagine, prior to this coming to Earth, this has been sitting in space for four and a half billion years in the ultra high vacuum of space, completely pristine, not touched by humans, not been by in any atmosphere, is out in the high vacuum of space. The, sen the second it comes into the Earth's atmosphere, it's, let's say it's, this has got 20, 30% porosity, it sucks up air. As it sucks up air, it also sucks up 
things that are in the air, organic compounds, if you ever smell perfumes or soaps or anything, those perfume chemicals get sucked into it. Not only that, every time you take a breath, whether you like it or not, you're breathing in spores, you're breathing in pollen, that stuff can get sucked into it in them as well. So it also contaminates them. So hence I'm wearing gloves. And that's also why we keep them under the, under the dry nitrogen. So it preserves them for future study. So if I were to just leave this out in the atmosphere or take it home and just leave it out in the atmosphere, it wouldn't look any different. It would never look any different. It would just stay the same. But then if we were to analyze it in the lab, we would see the changes that have taken place just by it being present. And this actually segues nicely into why we have return missions, in particular the, mission, the, Osiris, Rick, the Osiris Rex mission to Bennu. It's bringing back the most pristine samples of a dark asteroid we've ever seen. In fact, it's an asteroid that's probably s that has mineralogical and other, co and other compositional similarities to many of the carbonaceous chondrites. It's called a carbonaceous chondrite. It's many of the carbonaceous chondrites we have here on Earth but pristine, that's the big difference. No matter how quickly we pick this up off the ground and how quickly we get it into the lab and put it under nitrogen or high vacuum, it will always be slightly contaminated. And so there's been this real need to bring back some pristine materials. We have recently brought back some materials, the Japanese mission to Ryugu brought back some materials and there was a really interesting paper on that, out on that just a few days ago that says that it's mineralogically very, very similar to some of the materials that we have in here, but again, completely unaltered by Earth. So if we just leave this out in a, if I were to just, if I were to weigh this now, this has been under, in nitrogen now, and I were just to take this out into the normal humidity of the atmosphere, this would get quite a bit heavier by tomorrow as it sucks up moisture from the atmosphere. And we have a question. Yeah, so we, in our schedule, we were gonna take a little break We've got some poll questions for the audience, and we have uh, some some questions from the audience we're going to share with you. So, okay. so Kim, if you would get the poll up, I see them up there. You see, there's three true and false questions. If you uh, all just take a take a little stab at this, and uh, let's uh, and as soon as we get some results, I'll share those with Lawrence. And in the meantime, I'm going to let uh, uh, Alicia ask, do a, an audience question. So you kind of touched move, on let's, it. Yes, yeah, move back a bit because I get too much oh. hissing behind my ear. Okay. So Matthew wants to know, have amino acids been, been observed in any of these samples? Absolutely. And in fact, our, our former director, our founding director, Carlton Moore, was on the first scientific paper that came out in 1970 that detected extraterrestrial amino acids. See, the real problem is, as we've just been alluding to, if you were to pay, if I were to even touch a meteorite, like the carbonated chondrite, and then somebody who analyzes amino acids were to look at it, they would say, oh, somebody's touched it. That's how sensitive it is. So what Carlton Moore did, there was a meteorite that fell in 1969. Sorry, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna grab a meteorite over here. <laughs> this is the problem with moving, moving a, a camera off. So this is called Murchison. This is one of the most famous meteorites. And I also say the meteorite that started the whole field of astrobiology. When this fell in 1969, our founding director got some materials directly from Australia. He was also a, a chemist, so he understood the necessity of, of looking at things in really pristine conditions. They sent it to a lab. They broke it open under, under clean conditions, took out some of the interior, material, interior of the meteorite, and analyzed it for uh, amino acids. And guess what? They found lots of amino acids in there, i.e. the building blocks of proteins. Not only did they find, it's a chemical compound, an amine and an acid group. Not only did they find lots of amino, different types of, of amino acids, they also found all the protein amino acids in there as well. So now when we, now when we analyze other carbonaceous chondrites like this, these clay-rich, organic-rich mud balls, we find amino acids in all of them. the polls, we, the people have had time to put in their, their, their answers. And so if you remember, Lawrence, we had three questions. Yes. The first one was about the heat when they come down. And the audience is exactly split. Okay. It's about 46, oh, 48. Let's address this one. I love this okay. question. So our okay. me, when, me, when a meteorite hits the ground, is it burning hot? Now you would think, okay, so we have, we're gonna have to think a little bit about what's happening here. We have a stone that's in space. If it's in, the, if it's in the shadow of the earth, it's gonna be quite cold, it's gonna be below freezing. It's then gonna travel through the earth's atmosphere, the upper, the upper atmosphere, the, the, sort of the top two thirds of the atmosphere, at like, let's say 
a rough a rough speed of forty thousand miles per hour. So it's gonna it's going to, that's gonna and then it's gonna the outside of that stone is gonna get really really hot, thousands and thousands of degrees. Hence we see the meteor shining brightly, incandescent. But it's all it's doing is sloughing away the surface. So as the, the surface that gets heats up is instantly vaporized off the sample. Now when this rock now we're talking about something that's about this big maybe about the size of this room. As this rock then gets into the lower atmosphere, typically what happens, and there's always exceptions to everything, typically what happens is that, that rock, the, the pressure, the ram pressure on the rock, the atmospheric pressure on the rock is so great that it breaks it up. It then loses its extraterrestrial velocity and then drops to the Earth under, uh, uh, at a few hundred miles per hour at the, at the, at the most. Sort of dark, it's called dark flight. It hits the ground at a few hundred miles per hour. And hence, you know, stones that have fallen through people's roofs, for instance, they'll go through, through into somebody's house, they'll go through a roof and they'll embed itself into the concrete or something like that. But it doesn't sort of blow the whole house up. Now, we also know, so, okay, so let's just step back. So the center of the stone, the stone that's then hitting the ground, still essentially has the same temperature as it had in space. So it's typically cold to warm, cold typically. So to give a beautiful example of that, let's say, um, actually, I don't want to take this one out. Can we, let me open this. So here's another meteorite that fell in 1969 called Allende. This one fell in Mexico. This one landed in a hayfield. The hay just stuck to it. It's not burnt. It's not carbonized. So this is a wonderful example. Now, like with everything in science, Do I see it still has the hay on it? It still has the hay because <laughs> this big rock smacked into the hayfield. Okay. Okay smacked into the hay field, and the hay just stuck to it. It didn't burn to it. It didn't burn on it. Now, let me just say, okay, there are, like with everything in science, we can find exceptions. Carancas was a meteorite that fell in South America a few years ago that, for some reason, and we still don't really understand, it was a relatively small object, probably about, I don't know if you can see it, about this big, when it hit the ground, it slowed down a little bit, but it didn't break up. It hit the ground at extraterrestrial speeds, so it never had a dark flight to it. So there's some, and we're not, we're still not totally unsure, understand why it survived and hit the ground at high velocities. But most of them don't do that unless they're really big, i.e., meteor crater. I'm going to move on to the next. One. Okay. The remember, the next one was about radioactivity. Okay. And are meteorites all right? Do they have to be careful? Are they dangerous? And uh, the audience overwhelmingly said false. They're not. Dangerous. Thank you, audience. Thank they, you very this much. This is a savvy audience. I like that. That's a very savvy audience. There is now. We have to say everything is to a certain extent radioactive. Now, when now there is a form of radioactivity we do measure in, in meteorites that have just fallen. So if you imagine this stone has been sitting in space, floating around in space. You know, it's got an orbit around the sun like we have, but it's a different orbit. Now, it's been, it's been constantly bombarded by, by what are called galactic cosmic particles. These are little particles, are high energy particles that hit it and can cause radioactive isotopes of elements that, are, that only have relatively short half life. So, but it's so low. In fact, I like to say the bananas that you eat are probably more radioactive than any meteorite. So there is, like with everything, in fact, especially your granite countertop is way more radioactive than a meteorite. Okay, and then we had one more question, and this was my favorite. Okay. So here's the logic here is we have meteorite uh, showers, right? The okay. Perseids are coming up. It's everybody's going to get excited about that in the middle of August. So is that a good time to go out and find meteorites? Shower happens. I'm going to go out and find meteorites, right? After, after an event like that, any time is as good as any other time. So the point is, so you have to think of what these meteor showers are that we have, that we have regularly every year. They represent the dust that's been expelled by a, by a comet. So a comet is something that sort of, imagine, I mean, the, the common term is a dirty snowball. It's something that's gone around the sun, maybe it's gone back out again. But as it comes, as it has that orbit around the sun and goes back out again, it leaves a dust trail. That dust trail then has a relative position around the sun that stays the same all year. And once a year, we pass through that dust trail. And once a year, we get a meteor shower at that time. But when we, when we go out to look at those meteor showers, we are really looking at minuscule particles that come into the atmosphere and just vaporize. And even if it would be slightly larger, let's say the size of a grape or even bigger, cometary materials are typically very porous, very friable, and would not survive down to the ground. 
to know if that's not the best, that's not a good okay, time to go okay. out. And it really did get most of our audience. Most of them th thought, uh, two thirds thought, it's true. This is where you're going to find me to rest. So this is the point, right? Let's dispel, yeah. dispel some of this, yeah. uh, this some information. So, so the meteorites that fall, fall randomly. We almost never have a warning. The Chelyabinsk was a perfect example. Here was a bus sized object that just without warning came into the atmosphere and produced that, uh, thousands and thousands of meteorites. Even one of the most recent falls that we had here in Arizona, let's, I'm going to, let's move over here. This is one of my, so let's switch it around this way. I'm going to go here. I'm going to go here. So a few, a few years ago, we had a fall in Arizona called, that fell on the Apache tribal lands. It was about four in the morning. We had, it was a huge meteor event. Um, it was in 2016, about four, those who were up at 4.30 in the morning could have even heard. So the reason we have to say, what does one hear? These things, these objects are coming into the Earth's atmosphere faster than the speed of sound. So they're, they're producing shock waves that we hear. They're sonic booms, basically. That's what you're hearing when these things come in. And I, again, I'll say, if you go back and look at some of the Chelyabinsk videos, there's some amazing videos of, of the sonic booms that reverberate after these things come in. So again, 2016, okay, this also leads to something interesting. So a, a beautiful meteor event was seen, a big meteor event was seen over eastern Arizona. And several cameras around Arizona captured this event. And you can imagine, since we have video footage from several different directions, we can also then triangulate the inclination of this thing, how fast it was going, how it was coming in. We also know where, at what uh, height above the Earth's surface it broke up. But then, you can imagine, these things still have a velocity, a direction, and a speed. We then have dark flight of these materials that are moving. The movement of the stones in the atmosphere were actually captured by Doppler radar. Doppler radar, which looks, is the normal Doppler radar used today for the storms that came through, look for rate of change of speed in the atmosphere. Several sweeps, and I can't remember which radar station it was, saw movement of, these, of a cluster of materials through the, through the atmosphere, and from there, from that, we can then model where these things might be on the ground. And the modeling showed these things to be on the White Mountain Apache tribal lands. We actually got permission from, to actually go and search for meteorites. We didn't know there was anything on the ground yet, but with the radar signature said, search, for an, search this area. It was at the top of the mountain, midsummer. And when we started searching, we found these occasional, let's see if we can see, black rocks on the ground that were really easy to find because they were a completely different color than the materials that were there. So I don't know, I can't see, I can't, I can't see what they're seeing. So, we, so what, what we also say, what fresh meteorites also are covered by something called black fusion crust. This is, this is just the fusion crust that we see here. And if we look at the other side, this thing also broke up in the atmosphere. And you can see the interior of the meteorite as well. It's, it's white. That's just the normal color of the meteorite. So anyway, so we were very, very fortunate to go out and collect, to search for, find, collect, and able to study this, this meteorite. And this meteorite, with the help of the um, with White Mountain Apache Tribal Council, we came up, they came up and suggested a beautiful name for this meteorite. You know, this might be a great uh, time to take a question. Okay. Uh, Bob wants to know, how do you distinguish the pure mineral content of the meteor versus the effects of the burn and journey through the atmosphere? Okay. Nice question. I, I like that question. Let's go back to the, sa the sample that I just had. So again, let's go back to the story of, the, of, this, of this object coming in. The outside is heating up and is, and is, you know, is vaporizing off the surface. But there's a very, very, very narrow window of a fraction of a second where it goes from super high velocity, you know, miles per second, down to terminal velocity. And there's just a thin heated rind just on the very surface. It's very, very thin, something called fusion crust. It's only a fraction, it's only a, usually a fraction of a millimeter to a millimeter thick. Because just below that, it was at the temperature that it was in space or in the upper atmosphere. So it's, so it's a, only a very thin rind that is actually affected by the high temperature. So it does not affect the minerals that are inside the object. Good question. So uh, here's what I'd like to do if we do. We're kind of, uh, kind of at a stage where I wanted to have Armon come on and just show people how to find your website, okay. how to find more information. And uh, then I'll ask Alicia if there might be one more question. And then 
I wonder if you would station by the, the microscope. Absolutely. And just show a real quick view of what you do perfect. in the research. I can Does do that, that sound all right? Sounds perfect. Okay, sounds good. Armand, why don't you come on and sort of like give us a walkthrough to uh, where, the, where we can find website and more, more information. Yes, thank you, Rick. One second, let me just get my screen share. Um, all right, so I'm here on the website for the School of Earth and Space Exploration. It's just cc.asu.edu. And if you go over here under Centers and Initiatives and scroll down to the Center for Meteorite Studies, we'll go to the website for the Center of Meteorite Studies. And it's a really great resource. There's tons of information on here, tons of research you can, tons of news um, that's always going on. We have the Meteorite of the Month. And my favorite part of the website is if you go here under About to History, you can see just how, um, how rich the Busick Center of Meteorite Studies is in history, going back all the way to 18, uh, 1960. And yeah, this is the website for the Center of Meteorite Studies. And there's so much on here, so much for everyone to explore. And I'd really recommend you go check it out and find some amazing things on here. Thank you, Armand. That's great. And so uh, really with all the centers and initiatives here at the School of Earth and Space Exploration, there's always ways to dig deeper. And so uh, this one, I wanted to share that with you. Now, when we were in rehearsal, when we were kind of talking with Lawrence a couple of days ago, I was just fascinated by his amazing microscope. So I guess if we're going to take a little another little turn here. Um, I'm sorry, actually, I had the wrong view up. This is me in sort of the outer room of the meteorite study. So I'm going to kind of just go back to uh, Lawrence uh, for a couple minutes here. I want him to show you how sort of we use the microscope and how um, we can find some of the, the finest detail in the inclusions inside meteorites. Oh, well, welcome back. Um, I'm sitting in front of a petrographic microscope. This is just an optical microscope. And what I want to just address very quickly for the next few minutes is how do we go from a stone a meteorite that we know is a meteorite, so somebody's picked something up, to knowing Same what it idea. is. And here, actually, I'll go, I'll just start with this one first. Here's one of the latest meteorite falls. This is a thin slice of a meteorite that fell recently in Uganda. It's not yet classified. This is just a thin slice. Here you can see on the slice, you can see the black fusion crust on the outside. You can see that it literally is, literally just a thin crust on the outside. And we can see the white, the dominantly gray white interior and so how do we then go from this to saying, oh, it's an ordinary chondrite, or it's a carbonation chondrite, or it's something completely different? And so let's just start with that, the one, the one that fell in Arizona called Dischibico. So here's the stone. Here's one of the stones. And so what we do need to now do is we do now need to take a small piece of, a, of one of the stones, slice it, embed it in epoxy, slice it, glue it to a glass slide, and make a super, super thin slice. So here is a, it's a round glass slide, just a piece of glass. And we've taken a piece of the meteorite, glued it on, then cut it, and then ground it flat. And it's about half the width of a human hair. So that's, that's about how thick we actually, let's see if they can see that. OK, so you can just about, there we are. You can just about see there's actually a little bit of the meteorite actually on the glass slide, OK? So now what we can do is we can actually look at it under the microscope and actually say, OK, what do we see? You know, do we see chondrules? Do we see, I don't know, uh, rocks that, I mean, minerals that we would expect from an, from, from an igneous rock, for instance. So let's put it under here. OK, so now we're, now we're actually looking at the screen. So this is the lowest magnification. So we're at, at about 10 times here. Let's just focus it. So we'll focus. And now we can see the structure. Okay, now we can start to say, ah, what sort of meteorite is this? Let's look at the structure. Let's look around. Do we see anything, any recognizable structure? Do we see any chondrules? Do we see any metal? Do we see any aggregates of minerals? Anything that we recognize. And actually, this, the, the, the Dischibico one was actually a particularly unusual meteorite. We can probably almost, if I use my imagination, 
see a rounded object here, which may have been formerly a chondral that's been recrystallized. And we'll get to a, we'll get to a, a some example and discuss a little bit about what chondrals are in just a second. So by looking at this, we can start to see and start to get some sort of idea about what the textures are, what the minerals are, how they're connected, how they're interconnected, how they're related to each other. So what we're looking at here, I also meant to say, because the section was so thin, right? This is light that's coming through from down below. It's going through the sample here. It's the, then it's being magnified and then seen with the camera up here and then displayed over here. If we go to slightly higher magnification, we now have to focus it. We can now see some of the minerals that are, that are present here as well. And now, now we'll also have to say, these are false colors, okay? This is, this, is, this is the actual natural color of the thin minerals. We rarely get minerals in meteorites that are, have natural blues and reds and greens. Never say never, but very rarely. Most of the minerals in what are called plain polarized light are actually clear like this. But if we do polarized light, so we have a polarizer here and we have a polarizer above that's rotated at 90 degrees, we can induce a color change and that, which gives us some sort of information on the types of minerals that are present. In this case, it's mainly olivines and pyroxenes that we're seeing here. But to show how differently different meteorites can look, so this was the Distubico one, okay? Not all meteorites look the same in thin section. Let's look at, I don't know, here's another one. This is another carbonaceous chondrite. Let's change it over here for a second. Make sure I'm looking at the right side. Let's focus, if we look up at the screen, we can focus now. Now we can see it's completely different. Now we can see these rounded structures called chondrules. So chondrules, hence uh, ordinary chondrites and carbonaceous chondrites, chondrites, meteorites called chondrites. Chondrules are these little BB-sized and smaller rounded crystalline objects in these meteorites. And we believe, so imagine, step back in time, four and a half billion years ago, there was dust around our sun. When there, were, there were events that rapidly heated this dust and caused this dust to melt into these rounded spherical objects, which then over the course of a, uh, a few minutes uh, crystallized, and that's what we're seeing here. We're seeing these, so this is a chondral here, this rounded object, and we see these different crystals in it. And these different chondrules tell us about, oh, look at this one here. Oh, this one's fantastic. Tell us about events that occurred in the early solar system prior to it coming together on that early planetesimal that produced this meteorite. So this is a particularly special chondral. This I love. This says that there were multiple events taking place. This is a, a compound chondral. We have this central one here, which we call a bar and olivine chondral, which would have formed first. It would have got to high temperature and rapidly cooled. Then it would have aggregated some, then it would have floated back into the chondral forming region, aggregating more dust, and then through a secondary heating event, which caused this material to crystallize out here. Then it would have still been floating around in the early solar system, and then it would have aggregated into the material that forms this parent, that formed this uh, meteoritic material. That uh, just gives you an idea of it. In fact, you can see there's all sorts of different shapes and sizes, and we class, like with anything, we classify chondrules. We give them different types of names depending on the structures that are present and the minerals that are present. And so that just gives you, I mean, look at that. There's a, oh, look at this, this one's fantastic. This also says there were some other dynamic events that took place as well. So here was a chondral that had multiple things happen to it. It's only part of a chondral. So this would have been a chondral that formed floating around in space and got hit by something else and broke. You see, so this was a sphere and then it broke in space before it then aggregated onto this parent body. So there was a lot going on in this early solar system time. Can I uh, just add, I, um, I'm just amazed at what you can see from this microscope and you can tell huge stories about the history of these objects and what happened to them in the past. I think it's absolutely amazing, Lawrence. We have a, one more question for you from the audience, okay. and then we're going to have to, we're getting close to the end of our hour, so we're going to have to bring a close. Okay. Uh, so let me uh, turn a question over to you, and then we'll do a close. Okay. So Mark would like to know, um, could you speak to the observation of peridot in certain meteorites? Okay, peridot, or peridot, or olivine. Olivine is the actual mineral. Let's go and look at something over here. So olivine is a magnesium iron silicate. And interestingly, when we look at meteorites, we have a relatively simple mineralogy. There's relatively few 
common minerals. So in the thin section we were just looking at right now, it was a carbonaceous chondrite. There's basically five mineral, five basic minerals in there. There's olivine or peridot, which has different magnesium to iron ratios. So there's a magnesium silicate. There's also pyroxenes, which are which is also a magnesium uh, sorry a magnesium iron silicate. There's there's some feldspar, and then there's two there's typically two opaques. So opaques mean the light doesn't go through it. There's there's a nickel rich iron, and there's iron sulfide troilite. But some of the most recognizable uh, meteorites that we have olivine or peridot in them are the palisites. So the palisites are an odd odd group of meteorites that are composed basically of two types of uh, minerals. We have peridot, so can we see it? How, do we, how does it look? So if we look up, we have, this one's particularly nice. This, so if we look at the outside, this is how it was found, it's called Sim Chan. But when you cut it open, we see this beautiful, beautiful distribution of peridot, which are these green crystals, set in a matrix of iron, nickel-rich iron. And we have another one back here as well. In fact, so this is the, so peridot or olivine is present in the vast majority of the rocky meteorites. So, do we have Excellent. any other questions? Anything else you want me to address? We finished. No, we actually. Okay. Turn it back over to Rick. Well, thank you, everybody, and uh, thank you for attending. I think it's just just great. I'm, we did this the meteorite kind of tour once before in the two years of programming we've been doing, and I actually missed it. I was out of town, and that's really why we had uh, had Lawrence take over. But this is absolutely amazing, and and there's so much stuff here. Uh, we could do hours and hours and hours on just on the meteorite center and what they're studying and what's new. So I really thank Lawrence for joining us for this uh, this longer extended version. And lucky you to get into the vault and start to see some of these specimens. And Lawrence is amazing. And uh, as I mentioned before, I just could listen to him for hours. Uh, we do need to start to wrap up. And I have just a quick little announcement. I'm going to ask Kim Baptista if she'd come on the screen. Just something in the news last week. It's around here. It's it's hard to get through a week without something amazing happening. And uh, this one involves uh, Dr. Mark Robinson at uh, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera. So what happened? Um, so I will share my screen with you. And you can see um, there was some, what we will call wayward uh, rocket debris that we knew was on track to um, impact the moon. And so they've been watching this for a few months. It impacted in March. And so they've been trying to find the debris. And upon discovering the rocket, they also discovered two craters, which they weren't anticipating finding either. Um, so that was kind of a kind of a surprise and kind of a, a cool thing for them to discover. So now they're trying to figure out about the two craters that they've discovered on, on the surface of the moon. And also they're trying to figure out whose rocket this actually is. There's some speculation of yeah. what rocket it is. But um, yeah, so Mark Robinson, um, who operates the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera, is the one who found it. And it was published last Friday. Good. It was New York Times, right? So. And, uh, yeah, it's in the New York Times. There's an article. So I will include that link um, in our follow up email this evening. Thank you, Kim. That's great. Yeah. Hey, so what I wanted to do is uh, I'm just going to just sort of announce I was going to, well, let me just show real quickly. Uh, I always love this time of the lunar month because there was a new moon just, just within the last day. And that means the moon and the sun were just, you know, kind of just right next to each other. Um, right now, uh, just after eight o'clock, uh, this is sort of going to be the scene. The sun will be below the horizon. But I don't think you're going to be able to see this moon. I think it's still too new. I think it's still too much in the sun's glare, uh, but you can take a look. And now this time of year, it's just as easy to be cloudy. The sunset's really late. The twilight's really long. Sometimes observing is not very good this time of year. But uh, but this one is a gift that kind of keeps on giving. I always love this particular time when there's a new moon because if I just kind of bounce forward, uh, you know, several days. This is uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, uh, um, and uh, oops, let's put it back to Wednesday. Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, the moon just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It just moves through uh, several constellations of the zodiac out of uh, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, 
Virgo, and it'll just keep going to Libra and, uh, and, and Scorpio. So it gives you something to look at. One of the reasons to bring that up is we had just a wonderful email from one of our audience members. I just wanted to, to sort of thank him very much. He actually is uh, he's from Canada. He lives north of Toronto. Uh, but he really appreciates this idea about kind of having something to do after the program, something to do, uh, go look for. And I encourage you, try to fight the clouds, try to fight the monsoons. Uh, things will clear up a little bit. See if you can find this new moon as it grows day after day in the night sky. I'm going to announce two upcoming events, and then I'm going to give Lauren Scarvey the last word. So uh, our next uh, meeting is uh, two weeks from tonight on uh, July the 13th, and we expect to have the day before on July the 12th, the very first images, the first science images from the James Webb Space Telescope. You remember, we've been kind of following it. It got up in the space. It got deployed. It got into its position. It started showing us images about how it was aligning its mirrors and all of that kind of stuff, and now uh, they are about to release, and we're sort of, we should find out on Tuesday what the they're releasing as far as new images from the James Webb Telescope, and we're going to dedicate some time of our program two weeks from now to those images and that new uh, 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 process and how, how we're seeing and how we get James Webb Telescope images down here. Uh, four weeks from tonight, at the very end of the month, uh, we're going to go on the road. We're going to take our little show and take it up to Lowell Observatory. I think we mentioned this a little bit before. So uh, our intent is to broadcast from their deck, their little sort of super uh, visitor deck uh, outside of the Lowell Visitor Center. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about tourism in Arizona and space tourism, and especially and how Arizona is really a, a state that is rich with research, especially space sciences. And uh, and why not? We have dry skies. We got clear skies. Uh, many many observatories in the state. So we're going to be visiting one of those and talking about how important it is to us. So uh, with that, um, I'm going to give Lawrence, he says he's got a little teaser for you. He wants to leave you with something to think about. I'll turn it over to him and then we'll close. Thank you. Thanks, Rick. Well, look, we had so much to see and so much to do. I realized that I had not yet talked about, let's have a look over here, the amazing meteorites that we have from the moon and Mars. So unfortunately, all I can do at this point is just leave it at that and say, well, that'll be part two. Thank you for listening. <laughs> that sounds good. It sounds to me like we're going to have to do this more often than once a year. We're going to have to do, uh, in fact, I think actually a Mars and Moon uh, study of meteorites and some of our current sort of missions that are headed towards Mars and the Moon, uh, some of the things we're discovering. Maybe that's maybe that's a night in, in total and we can sort of bring that together. That would actually be really, really super cool. Lawrence, thank you so much for giving your time. Uh, uh, and uh, it's always amazing. I always love sort of hearing uh, what, you, what you, you talk about in the vault and I see something new every single time I'm in here. And so uh, what a treasure, what a great thing for ASU to have. And, and for the audience, uh, thank you very much for visiting. We'll see you in two weeks and uh, you know, keep checking things out. Keep watching our website, keep looking up at the night sky. We'll be back with you in a couple of weeks. Thanks a lot.